quick announcements. So we have two events going on today. Some of you probably already figured this out. So if you're expecting to be at the blockchain event, you should be over there. So, uh, but nobody seems to be getting up in a hurry. So. All right. Welcome everyone at Avalor Iowa the Research Parks. Nice to have you here. Do we have any newbies in the house? Any first time? Welcome to the incubator. All right. Well, we're happy to have you. Um, if you, for those of you who may not be familiar, we do lots of events like these. So stay tuned to our calendar. You know, coming up in April, we have. Um, a two-part series on building a startup team um, with Professor Melissa Gravener from the Geese College of Business. Um, our speaker today also has some tentacles to the Geese College of Business as well. We'll get to that in a moment. Um, one other announcement, any COSAT teams here? Any student teams? Any former COSAT teams? I know there's at least one. All right. Well. I know that our friends from, so who run the COSAD New Venture Challenge, if you're not familiar with that program, that is um, the premier student entrepreneurship uh, activity, for lack of a better term. We don't call it a competition anymore, although there are about $400,000 in uh, prizes at stake for our student teams. We have something like over 500 students who are participating in that program this year. They will be doing their demo day. It is not here, it is at the I Hotel. They will be doing that on April 11th. They are looking for judges. I know many of us have imposter syndrome and think, oh, I don't, I'm just starting my company. I couldn't be a judge. But the reality is, is that everybody in this room, if you're interested in today's topic, you could be a judge with these student teams easily. So I know that they would appreciate it. Your time is a really great opportunity to see what students are thinking about, what their um, new technology areas of interest are, et cetera. So um, that is on tec.illinois.edu. If anyone has questions about that, let me know. It's a very interesting way. It's very low um, barrier or bar to commitment. So I know they would appreciate anybody's time on the afternoon of April 11th. So without, and I know that Tom often talks to our COSAD friends. Uh, so without further ado, um, I am happy to introduce uh, Tom Parkinson, who is, what is your official title? Senior? Senior director. Senior director, but really he is um, a, a, a long time entrepreneurship expert who has um, given many, many coaching uh, hours to our startups here at the incubator, to startups in previous geographies, including at uh, Northwestern University and other places. So he has seen a lot, and I think that you all will um, be uh, interested to hear that background, but also how it applies to you. So I'm excited to hear today's lecture. Tom is also involved with Illinois Angels, which is a program of Illinois Ventures. He'll tell us maybe a little bit about what Illinois Ventures is if you're not familiar. But we want to give you a warm welcome. So Tom, come on up here. I'm going to stay here for one more second. So one of the things that we like to do so we know, so our speakers know who they're talking to is I know that Tom probably has a lot of content. But I do think it's nice if any of you want to introduce yourselves and tell us what your company is, if you have one, or what your idea is, and maybe what brought you to today's workshop. That would be great. Do I have anyone who's willing to do that? Or do I have to pick on people? Because I will do that. You need to give people merch. I don't have any merch. Oh, actually, I have plenty of merch. Stickers. Lots of stickers. All right, Andy. Hi all, Andy Miller, um, Telltale is our company right there, so feel free to stop by the office anytime you want to. We're in the ag tech space. We help lower the cost of raising uh, livestock for livestock producers. So if any of you had uh, pork, beef, or chicken uh, for lunch today, we're trying to help the folks who made that happen uh, be more successful in their endeavor. Uh, appreciate Tom very much. He's given us great mentorship um, to date. Uh, excited for you guys to offer today. I'm Josh. Well, I'm Josh. Uh, we're inside AI. We use artificial intelligence to help healthcare providers make better strategic decisions. 
So especially things like determining what services they should be offering in what place to help them better reach their communities. And we're here because we want to learn more about how to price our product. I'm a senior modeling capability manager for ADM, and we have an office here in um, Research Park that we do chemical engineering modeling in. Um, the reason why I'm here today is because we do a lot of really early phase research and development, and uh, a lot of those oftentimes uh, are we're evaluating them as joint ventures or as spin-offs from ADM, and so getting some insight into maybe how I can gain some knowledge on pricing strategy and can help, you know, do faster turnaround on these projects or um, at least make, you know, initial assumptions about what maybe prices we could expect from the products that we're looking at. Thanks, people. All right. Without further ado, I'll turn it over to you, Tom. Thanks. Um, all right. I will. Um, was just talking with Josh a minute ago. Raise your hand if you're planning to go see the eclipse in a couple of weeks. All right. How many of you have already bought some of the eclipse classes? How much did you pay? My husband is an astronomer, so if you have any questions, you can <laughs> <come>. Okay. <laughs> so what did you pay for eclipse classes? Um, it's, um, they have got a bunch of the, like, uh, you know, the first play option. I actually don't know the individual. Unit price, but uh, certainly any questions related to the Okay. Any, anybody else? I mean, Josh, you said you paid. I paid like $15, $20 for the Okay, who else? I think ours were $4.50 to $5 bucks maybe for one. $4.50 to $5 bucks for one. Anybody else? So, with, um, seven years ago, when I went to see the last eclipse, it was amazing. You could buy it, you could spend about anything you wanted to spend on eclipse classes. And, I, and it makes me think of you know, the topic today, which is, what are customers willing to pay? And that's not always the same, and it's not always the same for the same, even the same customer at different times. Uh, and so what I want to do, talk about today a little bit, is just how to think about pricing your product or service. I, by and large, I think most entrepreneurs um, leave money on the table. Um, and don't set a high enough price or as high a price for their product or service as they should, maybe because they think they need to offer a low price to get initial market adoption, or maybe because they're not really confident about their value proposition or something like that. But I'm going to try to spend a little time talking about some really basic pricing strategies and some ways to think about an initial price for your product or service. Let me see what I've got here. Uh, before I do that, I'll just introduce myself. I'm Tom Parkinson. I'm with Illinois Ventures. We're upstairs. We're the venture capital arm of the university. We're part of the system office, which includes uh, UIC in Chicago as well as UIUC. And our mission is to help advanced technology startup companies that are affiliated with the university raise equity capital. We have a fund that we manage that makes very early stage investments. Over the years, we've actually raised a series of larger venture capital funds where we've acted as the manager. We're hoping to launch our fourth one next quarter. Uh, we're currently investing out of our third. And then, then last year, we also launched Alina Angels, which is a network of high net worth alumni of the university who, who want to invest in university startups. And we're off to a great start with the Angel Group uh, has about 70 members. They've already made six investments in the first year. Um, for, as a point of reference, MIT's Alumni Angel Network, it took them two years before they made their first investment. So we're pretty proud. Uh, we had a bunch of people that are anxious to roll up their sleeves and actually get things done. So let's jump into it. Um, you've probably, if you've done things like i -Corps or taken some business classes or read about the lean startup method or things like that, you've um, um, probably thought a little bit about business models or talked about what your business model is. So a business model 
That is, um, that is a description of how your business is going to operate, providing goods or services to its customers in order to generate a profit. That's the whole point. That's why we're all trying to get businesses up and running is to do these things. The business model actually describes what your strategy is for doing that. And I think it's important, I like to come back to reminding people of really what the most important concept in the lean startup approach to entrepreneurship. And that is to recognize that your startup is not a business. It doesn't really become a business until you have actually found a, certainly at least a viable, but hopefully a repeatable and scalable business model. And we're going to talk a little bit more about what that means. In the meantime, your biz startup is really just a group of people who are trying to find that business model. And until you find it, um, it's, not re it's still a startup. It's not really a business. And, and I think that's a good way to think about startups. So when I say repeatable and scalable, what do I mean? So a company that has a repeatable business model is one where you can do the same thing over and over again for other customers and do it in pretty much the same way and get pretty much the same results. You don't have to con constantly reinvent your product or service. It doesn't have to be super customized for every single customer you have to do, you, you, you have to serve. And you already know that generally what your costs are going to be so that you can have a sense that you can predict what how profitable each customer is likely to be for your business. A scalable business is something that's even better. And a scalable business is one where you've really got your value proposition and your product market fit figured out. And now it's time to step on the gas. You can start spending money on sales and marketing and try to attract lots of customers because you now know that each of those customers is actually going to be adding value to your business. I'm not going to talk too much more about uh, metrics today, actually, Laura, you said that one of your other programs is a two-parter. I was kind of hoping that this will be a two-parter eventually, but it, it kind of depends on how well this goes. If anyway. <laughs> but I do have sort of a follow-up um, talk I can give to this, where I start talking about things like customer acquisition <coughs> cost and customer lifetime value and other things like that, which are really kind of important to understand for a startup business. Okay, good, good, good. They haven't given me a, time, a date and time yet, so I never believe it's real until I see that. So that scalable business, so really when you think about it, until you have found a really scalable and predictable business model, it doesn't really make sense for you to go out and start spending a whole lot of, lot of money on sales and marketing to acquire new customers, because you can't actually know ahead of time that those customers are gonna be customers that are actually valuable, that they're gonna be create profits for your business over, over time. Um, but that's the goal, is to find that repeatable and hopefully scalable business model. Now, I want to talk a little bit about um, how businesses make money and how they grow. So, in a, here's, you, you probably, this, this is not exactly rocket science. If you have a traditional sales model for your business, you're selling a product or service and your customer is walking away having taken possession of that product or they have received that service, your revenue in any given period of time is going to be equal to the number of customers you have during that time period, whether it's a month or a quarter or whatever, times the number of visits they make to your business, the times they purchase from you during that period of time. Think about a convenience store where you might have some customers come in every day, and other customers once a year, you know, you're going to have some sort of an average. And, that's, and you multiply that times your average ticket price. And I talk about a ticket price because many of your businesses actually may not just have one product. You might have a bundle of products or a bundle of products and services that you offer. And that's, how, that's, it. that's what your revenue is going to be in any given period of time. If you have a subscription sales model, how many of you have that? A bunch of you. Everybody loves recurring revenue, right? 
A subscription mo model, that means your revenue is going to be equal to the number of paying subscribers you have during that period of time. Let's say it's a year times the average number of months that they're going to continue to subscribe from you until they eventually churn. That's why you have to monitor your churn rate really closely. Times the monthly subscription price that you're charging, right? And so we've seen the word price come up twice here, and that's on purpose. But your goal isn't just to grow your revenues. Your goal, goal is to be profitable, right? And so let's, how, do you, how do you figure out what your profits are likely to be? Again, in any given time period, your profits are going to be equal to your revenue minus your expenses. But let's think about what those expenses are. Let's um, talk about, first of all, your contribution margin. And your contribution margin is going to be equal to the price that you're charging for your product or service minus whatever variable or direct costs you have with producing that. The example I like to give is, let's say your business is a shoe store, all right? And so you are selling a pair of shoes for $100. Your supplier is charging you $60 for that pair of shoes. You have a contribution margin of $40 per pair of shoes that you sell. Make sense? And then, uh, so you multiply that contribution margin times the number of units you're going to sell, the number of shoes, the number of software subscriptions. And uh, then you have to actually uh, subtract from that total the cost of actually operating the business. That's your overhead. Now, you need to think about your costs. Um, I, I encourage you to think about your costs in three large buckets. You've got the cost of providing the product or service, the $60 for the shoes, or the, if you have a consulting business, the price you're paying as an hourly rate to the consultant that's working for you. Um, and then your, your, um, the cost of actually acquiring customers, that's what you spend on sales and marketing. And then you have company overhead, which is actually running the business. So your rent, your insurance, your administrative salaries, things like that. But the contribution margin is just associated with the actual cost of producing and delivering the product and service that you're providing. So when we think about trying to grow your business's profits, there's really four ways, fundamentally, that any business can increase its profits. All right? You can get more customers. You can charge higher prices. You can reduce your variable costs in some way, find a different vendor who will sell your shoes for 50 bucks instead of 60 bucks, or hire more junior people as consultants for your consulting business, right? Or you can lower your overhead costs, which is that cost of running the business, pay less rent, you know, lay some of your administrative people off, things like that. Make sense? Which of these things do you think you, as the entrepreneur, have the most control over? What do you think? Number two. That's why we're all here today, right? Hopefully that should be fairly obvious. I believe the answer to that is number two. And some of you might argue, well, wait a second. If I charge higher prices, won't I have less customers? And the answer to that is maybe, but not definitely. You'd kind of like to know the answer to that question, right? So um, let's talk about how important price really is for your business. If you have competition and your competition is selling something similar to you, then all else being equal, the company that's able to charge the highest price for the products or services that it is offering is going to be the one that's going to earn the most profits, both on a per unit basis, but also um, overall, uh, after paying all those overhead expenses and things like that. And the one that's the most profitable, or the quickest to become profitable, that's the company that can control its own destiny. What do you think I mean when I say control your own destiny? Raise your hand if you think you know what I mean by that. Yeah? Survive and thrive. Survive and thrive, yes, but something more than that. Remember what I do for a living. I'm an investor. The one that is um, the company that's most able 
to control its own destiny is the one that is the least reliant on people like me. You can, your company is going to be self-sustainable, generating profits and cash flow, and you are less reliant on having to raise money from outside investors just to keep the business afloat. You know the best thing to raise money from investors for? Everybody has to do it for startups. That it's almost impossible to avoid. But the best thing to raise money from outside investors for is to grow your business once you've already gotten to the point where it has the ability to be, to be profitable, but you're choosing to grow the business. And so that's like an offensive financing instead of just raising money to stay alive. Does that make sense? So um, I'm not going to do the poll question. There's only two major rules for pricing. Obviously, you want your price. The lowest price that you can charge has to be at least enough for you to cover your costs. Otherwise, you're going to lose money and you eventually will not, your business won't survive, right? And the highest price you can charge is whatever your customers, the maximum amount that they're willing to pay. Otherwise, you won't have any customers because they're not actually realizing any value from, from, from purchasing your product or service. You've taken it all away with your price. I'm going to talk now about three very basic pricing approaches, and I'm going to may ask some of you to, those of you that have set pricing for your businesses, to tell me how you thought about it. But the first one I'm going to talk about is cost-based, or sometimes people say cost plus pricing. Super common. I would say that more businesses use this than any other kind of pricing. Essentially, what you're doing if you're following a cost-based pricing approach is you're setting the price for your product or service based on your costs, plus some sort of targeted profit margin that you want to make on each sale that you make. So if I have my shoe store, and my shoes cost $60, and my goal is to have a 40% profit margin, then I need to charge $100 for that pair of shoes. That's, a, that's it. That's pretty simple, right? How many of you, if you really look under the hood at the way you're pricing things, is this kind of the approach you're doing. It's based on your, your actual costs. Anybody? Is that because you don't have a price yet or because cause I'm surprised if actually, actually nobody's doing that because this is like the, what most people do. Okay? Say we have a, a hybrid where we have a baseline offering that considers cost and then we can upsell. Okay. And how do you do that baseline cost? Oh, yeah, we consider... Yeah, it, it's, it's super common. I'm not, and I'm not here to tell you that this is a bad way to price. There's a lot of advantages to pricing this way, one of which is it's fairly easy. You know your costs. You can make your own decisions. You, there's a lot of reasons why you might do this. Um, in this case, again, well, I'm not going to get rid of that. So um, the question with cost-based pricing, and there's a couple that you need to be thinking about if this is what you're doing, is first of all, do you really understand your costs? Um, many of you in this startup stage right now, your costs on a sort of a per unit or per customer basis are the highest they will ever be. All right? And are you really truly appreciating what those costs are when you're setting those prices? And are you making plans about what happens as hopefully you get a little bit better? At operating your business, or you start to get more economies of scale, and think about that. And do you really know what it's going to cost you to acquire those customers? Do you really know? Um, do you really totally understand that? And the other question is, do your customers really care about your costs? And the answer to that, for probably almost all of you, is no. Right? They care about what they're getting. They don't care about what you're getting, right? The second approach is competitive pricing. And if you're doing competitive pricing, essentially you're looking at other products or services that are available to your customers, similar to yours or comparable to yours in some way, and you're setting, you're using those as a benchmark, and you're setting your price somewhere relative to those other prices that your customers are able to see. You might charge more, or you might charge less. How many of you do you think this is what you're doing? You're setting your price based on what your customer's options are. Yeah? 
Anybody else? A few of you, right? Now, why might you want to set your price lower than those competitors' prices? Anybody? Yeah? Customer saves money by switching you. To get people to switch, right? So, um, the, the, the most obvious reason for setting a price that's a relatively low price in the market based on our competitors is because your customers already have some other solution and you want them to stop using that and you want them to switch over to you. All right? How many of you are doing that right now? Anybody? Okay. How many, now, why might you want to charge a higher price than your competition? Anybody? I know we've got you look real. You know the answer back here. Why might you want to charge a higher price than your competition? Yep. Because our product is much better. Because your product's better, yeah. right? And those comp competitors' prices, you want to signal. I mean, we all we all see this, right? You you look at several different products. In fact, frankly, one of my questions would be: Is the five dollar Eclipse glasses? Are those actually better Eclipse glasses than the ones that you paid 15 bucks for 12? Um, I don't know. They may be more convenient because you didn't have to buy 12 because you didn't need them. But, so, but, but the point is, in some way, there is something better. And you want your customers to recognize that. Um, we see products on the shelves of the store that have different prices. You know, we kind of get the sense that maybe the one that's higher priced is somehow better in quality. Most of you, because you are starting new companies and you're innovators and entrepreneurs, how many of you are trying to develop products and services that are no better for your customers than the competition that's available to them right now? None. None of you, right? <laughs> so all of you are trying to do something that, at least for your customers, is better than any other option they have. Right? So many of you probably would want to be pricing at the higher end, not the lower end. Um, I just talked about this. Um, and so the question for you on, on if you are using a competitive pricing strategy is first of all, are you in the kind of marketplace where this stuff I'm talking about where customer perception of quality or, or features or things like that, does that really exist in your marketplace? Do your customers, can they actually recognize that your solution is better than the others? All right, and if it's not, then it might be hard to use that premium strategy, premium pricing strategy to convey higher quality because they just may not get it, right? And, um, and are you in a market where customers actually perceive that differences in prices are a real signal of difference in quality in some way? And then the other question is, do you have a similar cost structure to your competition? Many of you, again, as startup companies, you've got a high cost structure right now on a per unit basis, and many of you are competing against larger companies that have many more economies of scale. And so you're, it might be a little bit of a disadvantage if you're trying to use a, a competitive pricing strategy um, in that situation. Make sense? So now let's talk about the third approach, and that's value pricing, all right? And in value pricing, this is actually, uh, I would say, of the three really broad approaches I'm talking about, it's probably the least commonly used. But I think when we all think about it, we would love to be able to do this. Uh, but it's hard. It's hard because you're setting your price based on the best estimate that you can make of the value that your customers actually perceive in your product or service. How many of you are doing a lot of customer, or have done a lot of customer discovery? All right, good. And so the question I would ask is, how do you, in customer discovery, try to get a sense of your customer's willingness to pay? Does anybody feel that you've done a good job of that? Go ahead. We always try to ask them how much they're spending to fix the problem and how much it costs them when they fail. What he said is they asked how much it, co it costs them to fix their problem, right? And how much it costs them when that solution fails. All right? That's a little good, actually good questions. You know, you don't just sit down and you don't have to, you don't get a customer discovery interview and say, you know, 
put your product away. But you can ask a bunch of questions like this. I have a guy when I in my class that I bring in every year as a guest speaker to talk about being persuasive. And he says that um, one of the best questions to ask in customer discovery is uh, for you to ask, what would the world be like for you with my solution in it? All right? Maybe you don't word it exactly that way, but that's what you're trying to get the sense of. How much time would you save? How much would your day be better? How much, how much would your job be easier? How much, would, how much more profitable would your business be? You know, how much just better would you feel? You know, questions like that. And get your customer to start talking about um, how important they think the solution is to them, and then try to figure out how you would translate that into sort of a value. Yes. Yeah, another question we ask is, uh, we do like the doctor's office type of question of how painful this is, kind of give it a scale. Okay, asking the one to 10. Yeah. yeah. Um, so then, if, once you have done it, it's the best job you can possibly do in customer discovery, and again, you're always doing customer discovery, even after your business has been up and running for a long time, is you want to set your price to capture as much of that value as you can, all right? And your ability to capture that value is going to be based on uh, uh, market dynamics. Has anybody taken a strategy course or a marketing course in a business school? How many, is anybody familiar with Michael Porter's Five Forces? Oh, yeah, yeah. So have you seen this, right? So Michael Porter is probably the most famous marketing professor. Uh, uh, I assume he still is anyway. Um, and he is the, really the father of talking about profits as being your goal. Everything has to be about profits. And he said that the, an industry or a market, the attractiveness of this market can be assessed based on looking at these five forces. And these are how much bargaining power do your suppliers have, how much bargaining power do your customers have, how much are you threatened by potential new entrants, into the market, how much, uh, uh, how much um, are you threatened by substitute products in your market, and just how much overall competitive rival we, when there is, is there in your market. I'm not going to get too deep into this just because we don't have time, but if anybody, you know, there's a lot of articles out there you can read about five forces, and it's, I think it's a good insight for you as entrepreneurs, not just to think about this market you're going into and how attractive it is but also help you communicate to investors about why this is a market that is right for you to be successful in. Do you have something? No, yes. Uh, maybe related a little bit uh, this, but uh, before when you mentioned about uh, the value, for example, we have done this question, so how much it will, uh, if you have such a solution, how much uh, it will it will uh, change. Well, okay. So, uh, something like, but they said, I don't know how much it will be, but what I'm sure that I'm going to be is uh, be able to sleep better. My question is, so because in our, it's also, there is a lot of emotional, that people do not put um, uh, uh, money signs, but this emotional mm -hmm. problem also that they cause. So, how you how to evaluate emotional significance on the value of a product? I think you do that in those customer discovery questions. You're kind of asking them to describe the benefit that they would have by having a solution to their product that would work. How much better would you sleep sleep at night? You could even ask that question. Yeah, they if, said, if, I really sleep it better. You know, if we take a step back and just talk about business models, you know, if you're how many of you are B two B, and how many of you are B two C? Nobody? Okay, business to consumer as opposed to business to business. You know, there's basic business models. Um, so, and when you think about the value proposition associated with different business models, usually if you're in a B2B environment, you're selling to business, then your business model is going to be based around helping your customers make more money, helping them save money, helping them save time, or helping them address some sort of risk or problem in their business, like they need to comply with the government regulation or, or something like that, right? Those are basically the four. For consumers, 
It's usually about helping them save money, helping them save time, um, helping them, um, what's the, I'm, not, I'm trying to remember what the third one is, but the fourth one is providing some sort of non-financial benefit. Oh, like help them feel more fashionable or help them, or, or provide some sort of entertainment or something like that, something that's got much more touchy feel than the other things I was describing. And you're in a situation where part of your value proposition is maybe helping your customers address some sort of risk they're facing that they worry about, yeah. or um, and and that, so that's the that's you have to try and understand what is the value associated with addressing that. Um, just a basic example of what I'm talking about here is if you're in an in a market where there are few customers. Let's say that you are selling, um, let's say that you're an ag tech business and your customers are big agricultural chemical companies, all right? There aren't really that many of them, all right? You're in a situation probably where there's few customers, they're large and powerful, and they've got many other people like you that they could buy things from. So that's a situation where those buyers have a lot of bargaining power, and so your ability to charge a high price is going to be somewhat limited. And so Michael Porter would say that's a less attractive market because you can't set prices as high as you like, and you, so you can't be as profitable as you would be if you could do that. Make sense? Um, and I, so I'm, I'm going to skip through most of these uh, just for time. Um, so if you are creating value for your customers and you want to use a value pricing approach. The question is, how are you actually creating that value? And as I was saying a minute ago, one of those is you're probably trying to do something, if it's a B2B, much more than a B2C situation, you're helping your customers make more money. You're helping them either get more customers or, or get more sales or get more profits by saving, you know, something like that. You may be helping them save money, and that's true in both a business-to-business -business and a business-to-consumer setting. You might be helping them save time so they can get more stuff done or have more free time to spend with their kids or whatever it may be. You're helping them to reduce some sort of risk. Um, and um, um, like you're providing, you know, maybe you're selling a fire extinguisher or something like that. And, um, or you may be producing that sort of non-monetary benefit like entertainment or prestige or fashionability or something like that. So if you're trying to implement a value pricing approach, then um, this really starts with lots and lots of customer discovery. And again, you're trying to make sure that you're getting good information from your, not from your, from your potential customers about what they perceive the value of your solution to be, how much are they willing to pay? If it's a B2B question, you know, some, in a B2B situation, it's a lot easier to ask a question like, you know, what sort of budget do you have for a solution? In a business to consumer setting, that's a tough question to ask because they won't even really understand what you're saying in a lot of cases. And, um, and then also really understanding what those options are uh, that are, the, either you or they have to look at as benchmarks. Now, I've gone through this pretty quickly, but I've also gone through it in a fairly simplistic manner in that we assume that there just is one single number out there for customers' willingness to pay. And we all know that's not true, right? Some customers are willing to pay more than others for the exact same solution. You paid $5 for Eclipse glasses, you paid a dollar a piece, roughly, a dollar and a quarter maybe. Um, I remember seven years ago when I was looking for Eclipse glasses, those people on Amazon, they were selling them for, you know, 20 and 30 dollars. I think that's because there hadn't been an Eclipse around here for a very long time. And so everybody thought it was a once in a lifetime opportunity. Um, but the fact is that customers have different willingness to pay. And so there's a number of things that you can try to do with your pricing strategy to try to rec real recognize that. And, um, and to capture more of that value. So I'm old enough to remember Sears. How many people here, a few of you remember going to Sears and 
buying products at Sears, right? And almost everything in that store, they had three products. They had Sears Good, Sears Better, and Sears Best brands. You know, the, 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 the one I remember most, of course, was like paint, all right? You'd have three cans of paint, different colors on the label, and it would be Sears Good, Sears Better, Sears Best, or not, and the prices would be according. And the expectation, of course, is that the good paint is good paint. It's what you need if you're trying to paint something. The, the Sears Better paint was higher quality, you know, maybe fewer coats needed, I don't know. And then at the top was the premium brand that somebody who absolutely wanted the absolute best paint they could get for whatever reason, that's the one that they would buy. Here's a really good example of that. One of the companies I invested in my last fund was a real estate photography business. Um, and so they would do the, when you're, if you're a real estate agent and you get a listing for a new house, um, you need to put that house, you need to get photography done so that you can put it on MLS or put it on Zillow or whatever, right? So if you're a real estate agent, you just got a listing for a, you know, $60,000 fixer upper in a bad neighborhood or something like that. How much are you going to spend on professional photography to market that house on online or in brochures or whatever however you would do it, right? Not very much. But you really need to have photography because a lot of the web, like your, your broker's website probably won't even accept it if there's no photographs. And you know that people who are looking for houses, they all look online. How many of the people have gone to realtor.com or Zillow, right? How many of you would actually spend time looking at a listing there if it didn't have photographs? Nobody, right? On the other hand, what if you're a real estate agent that just got a listing for a $5 million mansion in Palm Beach, right? How much are you gonna spend on professional photography to market that property? You're probably gonna spend a ton. Not only do you want somebody not just to be you know, walking around with a camera, you want somebody to be setting up lighting and doing, you know, you know, really professionally staged photographs. And you even want them to do lots of post-production work in the studio. They want to, you know, use Photoshop or whatever to make the grass look green and make the sky blue and maybe even use digital stuff to, you know, change the furniture so that it looks like nice furniture instead of what's whatever's there. You know, you all know where I'm going. And so they offer a silver, platinum, and gold package and that's the whole point is at one level they're going to do the basic photography you need to do that's good enough for getting it onto the website or getting it onto Zillow or whatever and at the high end they'll do everything and the prices are significantly different significantly different um, usually is anybody doing this Different tiers of pricing, have you been doing this yet? Okay, a couple of you. Most of the time, you'll find that the tier that where most of your customers are is the one in the middle. And so you need to make sure that your pricing, uh, that you're setting for that tier in the middle is the one that really works the best. You have a high tier just so that when you have those rare customers who are willing to pay a lot, you have something for them, So you because you don't want to lose those opportunities. And then you have the lower tier just because you don't want to just lose opportunities for, um, uh, just for, for you know, quick and easy customers because um, they think you're too expensive. Make sense? Um, how many of you are doing peak and off-peak pricing? How many of you read the articles a couple of weeks ago about Wendy's? When people were talking about how Wendy's and how it which they immediately came out and said, oh no, no, we're never going to do that. But Wendy's was going to do surge pricing. And so if you go into the Wendy's at a certain time of day, your hamburger would cost more than others. I don't know that was whether that was just bull. <laughs> and somebody just was trying to start rumors, but it was like, you should have seen all of the, uh, all the, all of the talk about that online. Um, and um, obviously this is like what Uber does, right? You want to get a ride from point A to point B, it's going to be a lot more expensive if there's a hundred other people that are also trying to get a ride from point A to B, point, a, point B at the same time. And as a result, your willingness to pay might also be higher. 
So search pricing or variable pricing is a way to do two things. Number one is to capture that extra willingness to pay if it's there at certain times. But it's also a way to use your pricing strategy a little bit to help regulate and spread out demand somewhat. So if you've got customers that don't really need to get from point A to point B at exactly this time, but can wait a half an hour, they can get a little bit lower um, fee, and then that helps you plan your asset utilization a little bit better. I was um, just talking this morning, actually, about a case study for the class I'm teaching, and we were, we had, I had gotten a hard, we had looked at a quick little Harvard case study, and I, one of the things I thought was interesting was, um, gosh, I'm, I'm getting off topic here. Um, it was a robotic parking device. And basically, it was a, uh, a device that would be like a, like a forklift, forklift. It would like lift up your car and take it and park it somewhere and then bring it back. And um, the original thinking behind that was that this was going to be a way for luxury car owners who are willing to pay lots and lots of money and don't like the idea of some 18-year-old kid parking their car, uh, but they also don't want to have to arrive at the airport too early. You know, this would be a premium service. But in fact, nobody really wanted that, is what they found out. And in fact, the real thing that they were doing with their value proposition was they were helping parking lots squeeze more cars together into a tighter space so they didn't have to leave room for people to get in and out of the car on both sides. And so it was allowing them to utilize their assets better. You've got a parking lot, you can fit more cars into it, you don't need to be to build another parking lot now. All right, so that's, that's not about pricing, but it's another example of using a technology to kind of get more better utilization or more efficient utilization out of your assets. Um, so I think the best rule that I've ever heard about pricing is if you are in doubt about your pricing strategy, you should try raising your prices. Um, and again, think a lot about the signals you're sending to your customers about your pricing. If you're charging a price that's too low, number one, your profit is not going to be as high as it could have been, or your loss will be greater if you're losing money right now, and that means you don't control your own destiny. You're going to have to raise more money from investors, and you're going to have to keep relying on those investors for a longer period of time. And you might be sending the wrong signal to your customers about how your price really, your, your product really isn't any better than your competitions or it's not really meeting their needs in a super special way, but it doesn't have really special features that's going to make a better solution. Uh, last thing I want to talk about, I think this is the last thing, yes, is early adopters. How many of you are dealing with early adopters right now? Most all of you, right? You're startups. So probably most of your customers right now are people that if you think about it, they would be considered to be early adopter customers. And this is just a graph of the technology adoption curve from the famous Crossing the Chasm book. And most of you are, deal are selling right now to people in that innovators and early adopters segment of the market. And what's famous about this book is it really talked about the chasm between early adopters and majority markets. Many companies that actually do find an early adopter market never succeed in crossing the chasm and being successful in a mass market or a majority market. But when you think about who these early adopters are, all right, they are people probably that are trying to get, they're trying to, they're, first of all, they're probably technical leaders. They understand new innovations, new technologies. They're probably interested in buying those solutions because they're trying to get some sort of competitive advantage. Sometimes there are people that are even willing to use your product when it's not complete yet. It might be just an advanced prototype or something like that. Majority customers don't want that. They want your product to work for them and they don't want to have any problems with it. And sometimes they're just people that want to be the first to use a new product or a solution. They like to be able to talk about it about how 
And so you look for early adopters sometimes by looking online at who is blogging about things or talking about new products and new solutions. Those are likely to be early adopters. Steve Blank has his definition, and it's really four things. There are people that already know that they have the, product, the problem that you're able to solve. You don't have to convince them they have the problem before you try and sell to them. They've tried to solve the problem before and failed, which means they are ready to adopt a solution if you can convince them that yours won't fail. They have to have a budget to be able to solve the problem or else they don't have the capacity to be a customer. And there are people that can influence others. So once they've got a solution and it works for them, they can be reference customers for you and help you maybe cross that chasm and, and, make, and be more successful in the majority market. So if you think about who these people are, those are people that are probably going to be the best customers you ever have and they're probably the people that are going to be willing to pay the highest prices of anybody for your product or solution. And so those of you that are dealing with early adopters but thinking you still need to charge a low price because um, maybe your product isn't complete yet or you're not well known in the market or you think and you worry that people will think they're taking too much of a risk by doing business with you and therefore you want to reduce their risk by charging a lower price something like that, I'd encourage you to rethink that because when you, make, when you try to cross that chasm from this early adopter market into the majority market, it's a lot more likely you'll have to reduce your prices then to have success in the majority market. It's not likely that you'll be able to actually charge higher prices in the majority, product, majority market than you're able to charge with these early adopters. So think about that as you're dealing with your initial customers. That, I think, is my last slide, and uh, that's all I wanted to say about pricing um, today. I'm happy to try and take any questions that you have. Any questions, any comments, any observations? Okay, well, I satisfied everybody. <laughs> So I, should have, I should have charged more money for this. Uh, part two is about um, moving on beyond price and thinking about um, customer lifetime value. If folks wanted to have some time in your orbit, what's the best way to do that? Um, I am, my office is right there. Um, send me a note. We, I'm happy to set up a time to talk. Um, you can connect with me on, on LinkedIn, of course. Um, send me an email, send me a note. I'm happy to, to visit with people. I've got a, a, a quick question, Tom. And, and I've got an extra microphone here. Uh, if we need that for the Q&A. Um, so you, you talked about sort of the difference between um, pricing at, at different levels. And I was, I was curious about how the the customer acquisition cost might change depending on whether you're pricing a product to the premium level versus uh, perhaps, let's say, the middle of the road kind of level, and whether sort of you've seen any sort of um, broader scale studies that actually show that the effective margin is actually higher for the premium pricing, giving potentially higher customer acquisition costs? I, I, um, so, I don't know that it necessarily is. Again, I think you essentially have, um, you could end up having really a fundamentally different business model for each of those sort of tiers, in that you know, for a premium product, you might actually have to have a completely different customer acquisition and, customer, uh, and, and distribution strategy. Um, so I don't know that it necessarily follows that that premium, those market is necessarily higher margin. And I don't want you to spend too much time worrying about customer acquisition cost by itself, all right? Customer acquisition cost is a really important metric for everybody to understand for their business, but it's really only helpful in comparison to your customer lifetime value. So those premium customers 
might have a higher customer lifetime value because they pay more for each product that they buy. Or, but, and so you could justify a higher customer acquisition cost for them as a result. Um, and, or if you have a subscription business and um, you're worried about churn rate having a big impact on customer lifetime value, you know, the longer your customers continue to subscribe, the higher the lifetime value would be. So you may be have, willing to have some sort of a trade-off. In order to reduce that churn rate, you're willing to provide some extra level of customer support or something like that to, to encourage people to continue to subscribe. So you've now kind of increased your customer acquisition cost, but you've also increased the lifetime value. Um, I admit by reducing that churn rate. So the, so the point is, I wouldn't worry about customer acquisition cost just by itself. Obviously, we would like it to be as small as possible, but a high customer lifetime value can justify a high customer acquisition cost. Does that answer your question? It does, yeah. Okay. It looks like there's a question. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much for this uh, seminar. It was really insightful. One thing I'm curious about is if you look at different businesses, they will have different uh, strategies for pricing. Some of them have very transparent pricing. You can Some just of them have very transparent pricing. Yeah. You can look at their website. You know, it says I guess maybe most are B two C. But then some of them, the pricing would be hidden. Kind of, you know, you get a quote, you contact them. What are some strategies behind having this? I would say visible and invisible pricing, and how do businesses go about? There's been a lot of. Um, um, <clears throat> I read a lot, I've read a lot over the course of the last probably 12 months or so about regulations in, I think, New York and California and some others, where if you are um, hosting jobs online, if you don't disclose what the salary is going to be, you know, you can't. Uh, and so I don't think they're doing that in Illinois, but some other state statements are actually, some other states are doing it. And I think it's about promoting transparency. You know, why, if you're posting a job online and you're trying to recruit people, why wouldn't you want to say what the salary is? Anybody? Maybe you're hoping to get somebody who'll work for less. Or maybe you don't want your competitors to know what you're paying. Or there can be any of a number of reasons why you don't want to be super transparent. Like, and it may just be in the situation you're describing, that, hey, I'm interested in this product, I hit the website, they won't tell me what the price is, I've got to schedule an appointment with a salesperson, or I've got to like, give them all kinds of information that I don't want to give them just to, for them to tell me what the price is. Well, there could be reasons why they're doing it. Maybe it's because they don't want their competitors to know. Maybe it's they're trying to qualify you as a real customer before you know, there can be reasons. Uh, I, um, and so I don't want to go say that transparency is always best, but I think you should be thinking about how transparent you want to be in your pricing strategy as part of your fundamental business model. Are you going after the kind of customers that really want transparency? Then you better be transparent. But if the kind of customers you're going after don't really care about this, and you're taking some risk by not by being transparent, you're giving up information that you don't want other people to have necessarily, then you probably want to follow that other kind of approach. I think that this just, you know, just as a broad observation, you know, I'm of the opinion that when you think about your business model, you want to think about it really deeply. And your business model, including your revenue model, your revenue model includes your pricing strategy. It all has to be designed with the kind of customer relationship you need to have. And so I, I know a guy that teaches, um, when I talk with him, he talks about Joe's Big Three, which is, I, I, his name is Joe, but I love this approach that he talks about. But he says that when you're working on a business model, you have you know, high level things, just you know, what is, what's the core of your business mission and then what does that mean for then um, strategies that you want to implement? And what do those strategies mean for actual rules that you want to create in your business about, am I transparent in pricing or not? But ultimately, that all is tied up, up to the real, the actual mission 
and, and fundamental strategy of the business. They all need to go together. And that's why if Southwest Airlines, this is a case of very old, um, kind of strategy and a certain you know, company culture that they're trying to sell to customers, then that goes through to um, sort of the strategy level, which is one kind of aircraft so that any flight crew can be any airplane. You want to turn everything around on the ground in 25 minutes. That means you have people stand in line in group A, B, and C instead of having assigned seats because it's quicker. That means you want to hire flight attendants who will, you know, sing or do little funny skits. You know, everything from the top comes down to the bottom. And um, I think that is the way to think about that kind of question. Anyone else? Okay, thanks. Thank you. Thank you.